Welcome to today's webinar on mechanical and durability aspects of electric vehicles. Our presenter today is Andrew Halfpenny. Andrew heads technology and innovation for HBK's ENCODE product brand. He holds a PhD in mechanical engineering and a master's degree in civil and structural engineering. Over the years, he has introduced many new technologies to the automotive, aerospace, and power generation sectors. These include customer usage monitoring, target customer analysis, proving ground correlation, accelerated laboratory testing, and mathematical simulation. His most recent work has been developing methods to measure and improve the de performance, durability, and reliability of electric vehicles. In addition to working with HBK, Andrew is also a visiting lecturer on structural dynamics and structural health monitoring with the University of Sheffield. Andrew, it's all yours. And hello, everyone, and uh, welcome back to this uh, is my second lecture, really. So what we're going to talk about today is mechanical and durability aspects of electric vehicles. So just to remind you, these three lectures we split into three. There's the mechanical and durability aspects, which we're looking at today. And then next Tuesday, we're going to look at performance and efficiency. And then next Thursday on reliability aspects. So just for, for those who weren't here on Tuesday, uh, just for a reminder for those who were, we're on about batteries. We don't think about batteries as just the little cells like the C cells here. They can be made up of many, many cells. And the cells can take different formats. They can be those cylindrical cells that we see, or they may be pris prismatic cells like the laminated foil pouches or the hard cases. And these cells are usually brought together into modules, and they're joined together in series and parallel, usually to produce about 60 volts DC. So they're just below the hazardous voltage limit. And then we wire those modules together and in order to get the battery that's going to uh, be in our electric vehicle. And predominantly, I'm talking about electric vehicles here, but the structural health, uh, it, it doesn't really matter what they are. Now, we had a look on Tuesday at what's, uh, what's in that battery, and we actually saw that in many cases, these batteries contain many mechanical devices. So if we take, for example, this cylindrical cell, it's actually sandwiched between two bus bars, and it's usually welded to, to that in, in some way. And obviously, as it moves along the road and it's got vibrations, it can vibrate. And those vibrations can actually cause fatigue in the joint. Now, if you consider that there's probably about 5,000 or more of these cells, then all of that vibration adds up. Now, when one of these breaks, it doesn't mean that the battery is dead, but what it does mean is that cell is no longer able to contribute to the charge capacity of that battery, and therefore we see degradation. And that leads to this progressive failure in the battery. So this occurs, in this case, through vibrothermal fatigue. So it's the vibration of the cell, but it's also the thermal expansion of that cell as well that's creating stresses. And it's made more complicated because the batteries are a, a, a sort of subjected to a very broad range of frequencies, and they also have a broad range of responses too. And the damping, which is usually there to take out and absorb this energy, is quite variable throughout the battery. So there's the vibrothermal fatigue of the joints. But there's another one too, because the batteries that we're designing today are designed to be structural. So they're part of the vehicle structure. They transfer road loads through the vehicle, they offer crash protection. Um, there's, uh, and, and this means that they're subject to structural fatigue as well. And you get all sorts of joints in there too. There's hybrids, adhesives, spot welds, all sorts of things. And all of these are contributing. And we want to look in particular at structural light weighting, probably not just at the battery, but of an electric vehicle in its entirety too. Okay, so that's what we're looking at. So just a quick introduction. What is fatigue and durability? So if you imagine that cell bouncing up and down, it's creating a stress, usually in that weld at the top here. And that stress, if we look at it, is actually cycling as it's moving up and down. Now, the stress might be quite low, but 
at a local stress concentrator or or a, a, a fault effectively in the material or a defect, what we actually see is that you get this elastic and then plastic behavior. And as it cycles around, we can see this loop in elastic in uh, stress strain space. And the area of this is actually energy. It's called strain energy. So where does that energy go? Under well, very low loading, the energy is actually all elastic. So it's just, if we imagine this as being a typical metal in this case, for our example, it's actually uh, uh, atoms in a crystalline structure and they move, the lattice moves. But if I increase it so that locally I get plasticity, what's actually happening then is I get this plastic behavior. And that's made up by this dislocation movement. And that's what gives us this plastic deformation. But if we cycle it backwards and forwards enough, what we end up with is persistent slip planes forming in this crystalline structure. So if we zoom out a little bit, we can see that and it looks a bit like a deck of playing cards. Each of these is a slip band. And as we shuffle them in fatigue, as we're stressing them and vibrating them, some of these are going to move in and these create our embryonic cracks. Some will get moved out and these get knocked off. But these cracks grow, and as they grow, they start to get bigger. And when they get bigger, they actually form a stress concentration. So now the stress has to flow around them. So there's this huge zone of plasticity here, and that's what then drives our fatigue crack. So fatigue is a two-stage process. The cyclic load initiates a crack, and then the crack grows until it eventually fails catastrophically. Now, it's not just the vibration that's involved here. There's also the thermal effects. And there's two effects here. One is that when we heat a material up, then its, its fatigue behavior drops. So the damage accumulates much more quickly with respect to temperature. Now, if we've got a metal in a battery at 40 degrees or something like that, or even 80 degrees, that doesn't really matter too much. But if you've got plastics and things, that can make a big difference to their fatigue behavior. But even the metals are subjected to constrained thermal expansion, which is another problem. The cells can move quite a bit. And if they're constrained in the thermal expansion, then that creates stresses too. So when we look inside batteries, we see these fatigue cracks growing. We can see a through failure in this thin plate here. And if we look in at a microscope, we can actually see that. Now, this looks a thick piece of metal, but I assure you, it's only it's less than a millimeter thick. And what we're seeing is a crack initiating and starting to grow into the material. And if we look on the surface, we can see it's also growing along the surface, too. And as it gets bigger and bigger, then we start to get these cracks. And we measure these properties in our labs so we can produce what we call fatigue curves. And I'll talk more about those later. So when it comes to battery durability, then how do we qualify batteries? Well, first of all, we have to design our battery to cope with these uh, durable, uh, durability effects. We have to choose a geometry in order to get the stresses down. We need materials that can absorb the energy and uh, are resilient to fatigue and so on. And we design them to last for a given fatigue life. Of course, we don't always trust uh, a simulation. We want to prototype that and make sure we're right. So we build a prototype in order to understand the performance to make sure that our durability is getting is, is correct and make sure that we're not going to be inundated with warranty failures. And then, of course, we qualify that design. So in this case, we, I'm going to talk about two qualifications, the shaker table test and also virtual vibration life prediction. So simulation as well. So I'll look at both of those. And of course, as we move on through the service life, then again, this durability is, is a major factor. So it's a major factor in warranty returns. So we want to predict those warranty returns and minimize them. We also want to optimize our maintenance strategy as well. So we're going to start today by looking at that shaker table test, and then we'll move on to the virtual simulation. So a shaker table test looks like this. So this is a HB case, a shaker table by LDS, in this case, a HBK company. And in this case, we're actually showing a radiator on that. And we shake it with a vibration profile to make sure that our, in this case, radiator, but in our case, our battery isn't going to fail. 
So we need to synthesize a representative test. And we usually do that in terms of a power spectral density, a PSD of vibration. It could actually be a little bit more than that. We can have things like swept signs, sign on random, things like that as well. But for most of our cases, the PSD is the most common. And ideally, we want to synthesize that based on real shock and vibration measurements. Now, what we can do is we can adjust that. So when we characterize the vibration, if we increase the loading, the vibration amplitudes, that will decrease the test time. So fatigue is what we want to keep constant. So we can get that fatigue life in a shorter amount of time by increasing the loads. And of course, we also have to be careful not to increase them too much. If we increase them too much, our test ring may become damaged or may not be able to reproduce them. And also, we may induce different failure modes in our battery, and we don't want to do that. We want it to be as representative as possible. So there's an optimum of that. So how do we do that? So we can take our electric vehicles on the proving ground and we can go and measure data, vibration data and thermal data on the proving ground. We can build a, a test matrix, if you like, of how many uh, miles of each of the surfaces do we need to consider. And we can bring that together over the entire projected life of the vehicle to create what we call a fatigue damage spectrum. So this is a spectrum that plots fatigue damage on the Y axis versus frequency on the x-axis. So if you're used to vibration data, you've probably been used to seeing PSDs. That plots the mean squared amplitude versus frequency. You may have come across the shock response spectrum. That plots the worst amplitude versus frequency. This fatigue damage spectrum is similar, but it plots the fatigue damage versus frequency. And then what we do is we synthesize a test on our shaker table which has the same fatigue damage, but over a much quicker period of time. It's an accelerated test. So if you're wondering that that all sounds very complicated maths, then HBK has software in the ENCODE brand to handle that. So if we take our recorded vibration data, we can bring that into the shock response glyph here, and it can calculate all of the uh, fatigue damage spectra for us, and it'll even synthesize the test then that we can then replay on the HBK LDS shaker tables. It also allows us to compare different test specs as well. So if you want to compare ISO with your uh, on-road measured uh, data, you can do all of that too. So you can compare test specs before you try them out. Okay, so we can shake our component and make sure it's tested. But we can also do tests in the virtual world as well. So how do they work? Well, in the virtual world, we actually measure the vibrations, uh, uh, as I've said, to create it on the, for the shaker table. We can simulate that. So our vibration loads go in probably in G or it could be in Newtons. We have a geometry which we usually use finite element analysis for to represent that. And that turns that load from G into stresses in megapascals. And then we have a fatigue curve, which turns those stresses into fatigue life. And from that, we can then calculate how long it's going to last before we get these fractures and these breakages within our battery component. So when we look at the virtual fatigue, what we're trying to do is to simulate the fatigue life of this test article. And we can do that once we've got that simulated model, a bit like a digital twin, if you like, we can play what if games on the model to save us having to build real components. We can play the model and we can try and get that right. So first of all, these models are really good for doing virtual tests before we commit to building the, the real prototype. So we can do lots of tests in the virtual land before we build the first prototypes. The other things that we can do is predicting design margins. So when we typically test these, we may test for either 12 or a 16 hour vibration test. And if it survived, we simply take the test article off. But we don't actually know whether it would have survived for 13 hours or 26 hours. We've taken it off the test, so we don't know what the inherent safety margin is. Also, we don't test very many of them. We may only test one sample and from that assume the whole population is OK. So again, simulation enhances the test by allowing us to see what the, the design margins are. 
So not only do we see we've passed the test, but actually we can now see with that one test that we've got a good design margin on that as well. So that's really good. And of course, we can measure strain in the test and compare that with our simulation as well. We can investigate failure mode. So when we know we've got a failure, again, that simulation allows us to play what if games to try and get rid of that failure and give us some idea of how much longer the life's going to last. Now, it does require finite element analysis to do that stress analysis too, but we can also use strain gauges as well. So we've got a combination of both of those and one helps the other. So again, if you're interested in this, then again, the HBK product is uh, an ENCODE product, and this is called Design Life. And this allows us to take those FE simulations and calculate fatigue from them. So that's really used a lot in the structural design. And most companies, uh, most automotive companies have been doing structural design for chassis, using that for many years. And the battery chassis is very similar. Of course, the battery also offers some other unique uh, uh, problems too. As we've said, the battery is made up of cells. And those cells are bound together uh, electrically with a buzz bar and also structurally. And that creates this vibration problem that we're seeing, this fibrothermal fatigue. One of my customers, uh, this is a quote I got him to agree to, to doing, he said, um, EV batteries are not just electrochemical systems, they're also complex mechanical structures. And we, the automotive OEMs, we're the structures experts. So this is really where it's got together to try and calculate and simulate the, the battery structure. Now, in order to do that, as we said, we need to measure the vibration loads, which we've looked at. We need to analyze the geometry to get the stresses, but we also need those fatigue curves. And again, HBK has this capability. And where I work, there's the Advanced uh, Materials Characterization and Test Laboratory. And here, uh, my friend Michelle will and her team will actually obtain those fatigue data for you. So you have to ask where, where you get these curves from. If you're doing finite element analysis, we're used to just chasing loads through structures to find stresses. And we're fine. We can just you get away with using Young's modulus for that. And if we're a little bit out, it doesn't make any difference. So FE is all about chasing loads through structures. But what we're interested in is simulating failure. And that requires a lot more uh, parameters and with a lot more accuracy too. So you could get them offline if you want, but I wouldn't necessarily design your next fleet of vehicles based on offline data. You could get them from suppliers or books, but again, it's the, it, it's the history of that data, it's the test certificates there. What about the variability in it? So the benefit what Michelle has to offer is that we pay for peace of mind, really. So we can test coupons of material or we can test components as well in order to gain those fatigue curves. And it's this bit, again, that can help us to get that improved simulation. So when it comes around to those little battery joints and the materials in them, yes, we can do all the traditional fatigue testing, the strain life and the stress life. We can do it on raw, cast, bars, extruded, thin sheet materials like the, the battery end tabs. We can model things like surface treatment effects. We can consider elevated temperatures, mean stress, and even the crack growth through them. But as we're getting towards lighter and lighter vehicles, if I was to take you around our lab today, virtually every rig is running on jointing methods. And we're looking at different types of weld configurations in different materials. We're looking at adhesive bonding, self-piercing rivets. People are looking at polymers and composites in fatigue as well. And there's a huge program going on because we see that the future is also going to be additive manufacture, 3D printing. So you'll also see a lot of that going on as well. So hopefully that's given you a little insight into what the problem is that we're trying to do and the ways that we can solve it. So in this webinar, what we've considered here is, first of all, that battery is a mechanical structure. And we're looking really at the fatigue design of battery packs. We want to characterize the vibration and the thermal environment of those battery packs. And then we want to derive accelerated tests, which we can put on a shaker table. And we also want to uh, uh, make them lighter and lighter by creating more and more simulation to make sure we've got the optimum weight in there.
So the benefits, hopefully, is that we'll get a reduced battery degradation, so longer lives of the batteries, much better understanding of the vibration and the thermal loads that are going into it, better understanding of the chassis loads as well from the proving ground analysis. And therefore, we'll get more representative vibration tests and ultimately a lighter and more durable battery.